You're listening to the Global Ed Podcast, where educators share inspiring and thought-provoking stories from around the world. In this episode of the Global Ed Podcast, I speak with David. In 2015, David and his wife, along with their three children, moved to Timor-Leste to start a school in the outskirts of the capital city, Dili. David, welcome to the Global Ed Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. David, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up moving from your home in Singapore to Timor-Leste. Actually, I was born a Malaysian, but I went to Singapore to study and eventually became trained as a teacher in Singapore uh, since 1990s. Yeah, and I've been a teacher in a Singapore school uh, for close to about 14 years. Um, and before I took a turn to to leave Singapore education and uh, planted my whole family uh, from Singapore to Timor-Leste to start a Methodist school in Timor-Leste. Obviously, it's quite a big decision to move your whole family overseas and take on such a role. What was it that motivated you and your family to make that decision? I guess, um, well, I I felt caught to wanting to make a difference uh, and to help the people of Timor, a nation, um, especially in the area of education. I think I've been blessed very much by the education of Singapore. And um, I thought it would be good that if we could, you know, do that, uh, provide some quality education to the people of Timor. Timor Leste's independence came at a great cost. A quarter of Timorese people were killed in the fight for liberation first from Portugal and then from Indonesia. For those who survived, the pain still runs deep. Timor-Leste became an independent nation from Indonesia in 2002. How would you describe Timor-Leste now? Um, How has it developed and what is the education system like there? The experience is generally um, a need for better facilities, education, I think in all aspects. Of, of a nation, uh, I would consider this moment an uh, underdeveloped nation that is hoping to be developed. But since they gained its independence in 2002, uh, a number of um, organizations, the NGOs, the, the, the churches, you know, the different countries, Japan, Korea, do come in to help build this nation in different areas, in different parts of it. So it's a nation that I believe um, there's in need of um, a better quality education. They do have schools, uh, that um, there are about 800 schools all over the country. Now, you're the head of a Methodist school that's located there. Whereabouts in Timor-Leste is it? So Timor actually has 13 districts and the main capital is Dili. And uh, so our school is actually planted at the outskirts of Dili, what we call the easternmost part of Dili known as Metinaro. Uh, the population is more sparse than in the city area itself. So the school is built at the outskirts. Um, I would say from the city centre, it will take about 45 minutes uh, to reach my school current locations. And what's the area that the school's based in like? It's a more of a rural area. Yeah, a rural area. So... Um, the, the houses are more sparsely located apart from each other. Uh, what do the houses look like? Um, like what, what are they made of? Mm, the house are mainly built up of uh, zings, or basically, of course, the more well-to-do will start to have blocks. Across the new nation, the education situation was dire. In the capital, Dili, much of the population had fled, and many school buildings were burned. Uh, as a consequence of the uh, referendum, uh, all the infrastructure, were, the majority, 80% of the infrastructure were, were destroyed, were burned, destroyed. Uh, in terms of teachers, nine, 80% of the teachers at the time were Indonesians or Timorese who uh, decided to join Indonesia. The students you know, were left abruptly, so we had to start from scratch. Since independence, it's been quite a challenging time for Timor-Leste and the education system hasn't escaped from that. But from your time in Timor-Leste, what has your experience been when engaging with the community with respect to education? 
I guess it's really about at the end of the day whether there is um parents um encouraging them to go for educations and all that because Timor going through the earlier years of fighting for their independence, they have lost basically a generation of fathers of 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 an older generation. So I would say Timor predominantly uh make up of young people. Right, age below twenty five, you know, about seventy to seventy five percent of them, and so having that, you know, um, the push for the education was important. Um, I guess many choose to to drop out of school, don't go to school. Um, so I, I, I believe it's really about having that um experience for them, having them to understand education is uh needed and necessary. And uh, and having to provide accessibility, well, of course, um, girls or sometimes will have to deal with you know many of the housework, um, the values of the men are more than the, the 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 girls in a certain sense. How do we provide equal opportunity or equal opportunity of education for all genders and all that? These are all part of the way we hope to help change a certain mindset, a certain belief. So. When the school was set up, what was its purpose? I think when we started this school, uh, the purpose is really to provide a quality education for the people of Timor, for the children of Timor. And now that it's been going for a few years, um, just give us an overview of where the school's up to at the moment. Um, so the school started in 2016, but only this year uh, they we managed to complete the building of the whole school, a permanent place and we move in. Basically, currently we have about um, a student body from grade 1 all the way to grade 12, a total of about 800 students. Wow, that's great. Um, some real growth there in the school, which is fantastic to hear. Um, so, David, just talk us through what a ordinary school day looks like um, at your school. So, the children basically come to school at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then they will have their silent reading and then they have a devotion and then they'll get into their classes and they will end about one o'clock and then we provide lunch for everybody. We want to address as one of the needs of this nation, yeah, to address the malnutrition, to also give them a proper meal yeah, so that they are able to develop holistically. Okay. Uh, wow. Sounds like you're not just providing education to develop these children uh, mentally, but also giving them uh, an opportunity to develop physically uh, in a healthy way. So uh, when the school started, um, did you intentionally set out to make providing healthy food a strategy to assist with their physical development and also their learning? Well, we come to realize that um, Timori still children are two years behind their chronological age. Yeah, and so in that, while well, sometimes we try to push for certain learning uh, in, in, in the school, they just couldn't grapple with it. Yeah, so their attention span is um, short and um, they're not able to, to analyze things as it is. So in providing these meals, we do see that there is a growth, there is a, a development in that. Um, so as the kids spend more years with us, the older kids now begin to have a greater endurance in terms of their mental capacity. I think it, it helps them to learn because generally for the Timorese, they love to eat rice. As long as they have some rice to, 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 to fill their stomach, to hunger, that is good enough. Yeah, and I think this is where it, it really affected their development or other aspects of their, of their body uh, in, in that manner. So, yeah, so uh, providing a uh, daily um, intake of meat or fish, vegetables, you know, all this helps in a certain way. Wow, uh, some great work there, David. Uh, let's move on to talk more about how the school looks and how it functions. So um, can you describe what your classrooms and what your school look like, please? The, the classroom is uh, typical to any classroom you see in Singapore. Basically, the whole school is designed by the Singapore architects in accordance to the standards and uh, of the schools in Singapore. So it's equipped with projectors, um, proper lightings, classroom tables and chairs, whiteboard. Um, the teachers are actually given a computer each to teach. The students do have their textbooks, their, um, their, their exercise book. 
Um, and, and so a typical learning in a classroom uh, is like any classroom teaching. Um, of course, we have a max of uh, 40 per class for the higher levels and the lower levels we have about max of 30. I'm interested to know about the languages that you teach at your school because uh, Timor Leste, um, one of its main languages is Portuguese. Uh, there's also some Indonesian languages there and, of course, uh, English as well. So um, as you approach curriculum in your school, what's your approach to um, languages? So the learning takes place mainly through English instructions because we are an international school, private international school that, that, does, in the, uh, that does it in English. The, the local schools here, Portuguese is their main language of instructions. So we actually work on the English language medium. So we are termed like a private international school, but uh, charging a nominal fee so that we could be able to provide access of education to all. So a typical learning in a classroom will have their math, science, English, of course, Portuguese is a compulsory language for them and their local language of the tomb. In, uh, in addition to um, those languages which you teach and also the usual subjects that you'd find within a school, are there any other um, subjects which you teach which are specific to their context in the area in which they live? Um, so we are hoping, we are, actually as a school land, uh, we are currently built on one, two-third, I, I would say one forty percent of our land. Yeah, so uh, 60% land is actually left aside for farming. So we set aside a 3,000 square meter to do farming. We are hoping to next year to start this farm on a mud crab farming as well as uh, a can of creek farm. A can of creek is a material that is used to replace sand uh, in, in, uh, in the making of building blocks. So what we are hoping right now is to introduce certain technology that will come on board to enhance the, the, the farming, the agriculture aspect of this land. And we want to equip our students with certain skills so that they could eventually go back to their community and, uh, and, and, and encourage the community to, to, to farm in a certain way. Or even like, you know, it's like a kind of creek farming. We are hoping that to get the surrounding farmers to grow these kind of creek plants. And then eventually we'll buy the plants from them and then use this to, with the technology we have in school to convert it into building materials. So in the, such a way, we are actually providing an outlet for farmers around to be able to earn some incomes through their farming. It's really interesting, David, to hear what you have to share there because uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about in education, of course, is the idea of authentic learning, uh, learning which makes a difference, uh, and also providing um, students with skills which they'll uh, need um, in the future. So it sounds like you're already doing that. Um, given where the school is, uh, is there other ways in which the school engages with the, the local community? One of the things that the school does because of us cooking for all the 800 students, you know, daily, weekly, we really need supplies of vegetables. So in, in other words, you know, when we buy the vegetable, we actually buy from the local farmers. So we have a parent of our students who helps to coordinate, you know, getting the farmers to, to, to sell the vegetables to the school. And just in recent one month or so, the farmers were just telling the parents, you know, how appreciative they were that right now they have a constant, regular income because the school is getting the supplies of the vegetables from them. So I guess this is how I think we could help the community because many communities actually do have the land and they do can do farming. But the challenge, I think there is no uh, buyers, there is no output for, for them. You know? And I think if we can provide this uh, end of this process chain, you know, that will definitely help them to have more stable, to be more stable in their living and in having a more consistent income that will come to help them plan for the future better. It's really cool um, that your school is um, helping the community, not just the students, but the local economy as well. Uh, in terms of the teachers of the school, uh, where do they come from? Are they local teachers um, or are there teachers which come from um, around the world to your school to, um, to help and be part of what you're trying to do there? So the teachers are mainly the local teachers. Predominantly, they must be able to speak English. 
So there are many local teachers. But since the school has started till now, we have three badges of graduates. So the graduates, while waiting for their next season, be the uni or the, the um, some other certification track, they are all now back with us, either as assistant teacher or, or teacher of the lower grades. Yeah, and of course, we, I myself teach, plus my family, plus some um, missionary from Singapore. They do come in and take the higher level of uh, teaching, uh, the teaching grades. So basically, right now, we have a pool of about 30 teachers, uh, full-time as well as interns, supporting the 26 classes of teaching of the different subjects. Authorities in Indonesia and East Timor say as many as 100 people have been killed in flash floods and landslides triggered by a tropical cyclone. Heavy winds and torrential rain pounded a cluster of eastern Indonesian islands as well as neighboring East Timor. Emergency teams are struggling to reach some of the affected areas. The water has risen up to my head and it's still not stopping. We need help right away. Your village is cut off? Yes, the water has reached the second floor. In 2021, tropical cyclone Saroja hit Timor-Leste and caused flash floods and landslides and resulting in widespread damage. Uh, how did that impact you and your local community? Uh, the flood is known to be the worst hit uh, flood uh, that hit Timor in the whole history of Timor. Um, well, I think Timor uh, being, uh, they do experience a certain wet season, a certain dry season. Usually the wet season with the rain comes in, um, there will be floods here and there. Yeah, there will be floods here and there. But in 2021, I think uh, the continuous outpour of the rain plus a high tide uh, in that period of time, um, it causes actually the whole city of Dili to be flooded. You know, the rivers that used to carry the mountain waters to the sea were just basically burst through the bank because um, yeah, the sea was at the high tide and then the, the flow of river was just too much. Basically, the whole city was, was, was uh, were, were underwater. You know, in fact, even our own house um, that we, we were having to, to try to move all our things up because the flood water came in you know, close to our uh, knee level. And then including outside there, the, the cars that were trying to drive out to the dry land because water were entering the car. I think it was something that causes us to uh, respond and react, you know, in, in this part. Yeah. So, so I would say that year the flood was, um, was, was causes a lot of damages to the people and the, the things. Clearly it had a significant impact on the local area. Um, how did it affect your students, your staff um, and the school? A number of students lost, our, lost their home. Basically, the things, the furniture, the, the uniform, the books, the things were, were destroyed, washed away. Some of our pet teachers lost their home as well. In fact, a teacher nearly lost her life too. <clears throat> like she was just clinging onto the tree and she was just about to say, let go, maybe that's it already. And someone actually grabbed her from behind and pulled her out. You know, I think that um, the, the, the damages to the properties, to the to the things that the resources. In fact, our own school, where well, my own house, where I kept a number of school resources, I have to throw about a truckload of, uh, of resources away. Some laptops were damaged. Some of our school textbook, uh, uh, exercise book that were new were all submerged under the flood and we just had to throw them away. Clearly, this cyclone um, had a devastating effect on the people and infrastructure of East Timor, uh, which would have not only included your students and families, but also those uh, living close to the school and um, the entire nation. Um, so what was the national response to the disaster and how did they look to um, restore and rebuild? So it was a flood that hits a whole nation, but it was also an opportunity for the different organisations, the Catholic churches, the school, the NGO, all come together and were, were helping different community. You know, the churches were open up for people who are displaced to stay while, they, while we cleared houses, you know, 
for us as a school, we also actually spend about close to 20K, rebuilt four houses, five houses for our teachers and students so that they could you know, have a place you know, to stay moving on. Yeah, so, so it was a, a time that I think it caused the school to move beyond just providing education, but also providing crisis relief and support and rebuilding a nation. It's incredible that you were involved in rebuilding the houses for staff and students. So being a community-minded school, were there other opportunities to help further um, serve students and families, workers, um, the, the local people as they responded to the crisis? So we had to also, after that, carry out crisis relief. So we actually raised about 60000 and we bought uh, normal you know, um, things like mattresses, pans, pots, you know, uh, pillow cases. We were t-shirts, getting t-shirts and clothing to the to the parents, blankets. And we went. We used our school buses to go to all our children, our students in Delhi, just to distribute this to them. And we didn't even just go to the, our students. We also helped the neighboring uh, families of the students. They if they ever needs for help. We, were, we actually also gave out water filter system because some the water were cut off. There were no clean water and we just have to provide certain filter system for them so that they could continue to sustain their living. I would imagine that the school's help to the local people would enhance the school's reputation both locally but also in Dili. Did you find that after the cyclone response there was an increase in interest in the school? Yes, I must say that it has because after that, the school enrollment shot up exponentially. Yeah, it's that uh, we had a usual enrollment intake of about 40 from 2016 to 2021, 40 each year. But since 2022 to 2024, you know, we have an enrollment each year, new intake of 160. And last year, we have an intake of 210. Yeah, so it has really caused the school to exponentially increase in enrollment. But I think what is also helpful was we have been seeking to get a certificate, our land title uh, for, to build our school since 2018. Yeah, but because of the delay, because of the certain uh, processes that the ministry require, it actually delayed. So to 2021, we still couldn't get our land title to build our school permanently. But the flood came, and through the flood, we came to know a parent of our students who helped to rebuild five houses for our teachers and that. Turned out that these parents is the brother-in-law of the vice minister of the land and property department. And that got us connected, link up, and we got our land title within three months after the flood. You know, and with that, brought in the whole process of how we could tender for the construction phase, brought the people into build, and this year the school was completed in January and we moved in in January. David, you shared earlier that the school's purpose was to provide a quality education for the people of Timor-Leste. Um, could you share with us some of the outcomes that your graduates have had once they've completed school? Yeah, so I, I, I must uh, say that I'm thankful that since the first batch has graduated until the third batch, four of the students have actually gotten scholarship to go to Harapan University to study to be a teacher in the International Teachers College under the full scholarship from Harapan. One of our other students have actually under the scholarship of Mission Aviation Fellowship, MAF, of uh, International, to, to now study aviation engineering in Australia. Yeah, they are in hope that he will come back and to be um, championing the work of MAF in Timor-Leste. That's so cool that your students are able to move on to higher education um, with the hope that they might one day return and uh, carry on the task of nation building. Uh, looking forward, um, what do your plans say for the next five years as you continue to develop the school's offerings? I foresee the next five years, I, uh, I'll see the more teaching blocks and more hostel blocks to be built to accommodate the, 
rising demand for a place uh, in, in the school. Um, I also foresee the school will be moving towards um, supporting post-secondary education, how we're going to run different vocational tracks so that to enable uh, some of those students to continue after their grade 12 to be with us, to be equipped with certain certification. Because as a school, we believe that we are not lending the student with a certificate, but we want to lend the student with a job. And uh, we are looking at different partners to partner us or uh, to come and um, help in the running of this course. So whatever course or whatever track we are doing will all depend on the needs of the nation. So currently we see a rising in uh, tourism and um, hotels being built. We want to branch into hospitality and so that we will prepare a generation of people ready to, to, to have a job out there. Yeah, so we're also looking at uh, nursing yeah, in, in the area of so helping um, people like surrounding countries who have growing in an uh, elderly generation, how that one day Timor could provide that workforce uh, to be able to help and serve. In 15 years, Timor Leste has established peace, founded institutions of the state, built its health and education systems, constructed infrastructure and improved the well-being of its people. All of this in a post-conflict country which literally had to start from scratch and rise from the ashes after 1999. David, what's your long-term hope for the school as it continues to build up the next generation of Timorese? So I hope that one day I will build up a generation of these students uh, to be crisis ready. That any time where there's a crisis that arises in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, any country, you know, we'll send forth our students to be there to help them rebuild a village, a city, you know, through their skills as, a, as in agriculture, as in a hospitality, to use this to be a blessing to other nations. And as we conclude, what's your hope for the nation of Timor-Leste? My hope is as a nation who will take pride of um, who they are and that they can also make a difference first among the, uh, themselves and make a difference in the world beyond. Thank you, David, for being on the Globe Led podcast and sharing your story. It's been a privilege to speak to you and I wish you and your family and the entire community that you serve all the very best into the future. Thank you for listening in. Thank you for... Yeah, giving you a chance to share about Timo. It was an absolute pleasure, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time on the Global Ed Podcast. Refugees here, they are not allowed to go to a formal schools, universities, and they, they are not allowed to have education here. So, yeah, that's why this nest was established. And it's from refugees for refugees. In the final episode of season two, I speak with Rafi, a refugee from Afghanistan. Rafi is the principal of the Refugee Learning Nest, a school in Indonesia that teaches refugee students while they and their families wait and hope for relocation. If you have enjoyed listening to the Globe Led podcast, please subscribe and follow me, Gavin Kinch, on LinkedIn.